Hello, Brighter Media Group friends. Uh, it's good to be with you again. And uh, we are talking this month about Christianity and science and are Christianity and science incompatible? That's something that's commonly held within our culture. You know, Christianity is anti-science, science is anti-Christian. Uh, these two are just always going to be in conflict with each other. Is that true? Uh, how do we respond to that? How should we think about that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that this is your world and that you have created it and you have placed us in it. And we pray that you would give us wisdom as we think about the role that science has to play in your creation, in the lives of your people, in the culture, and how we should think about, interact with, and speak to unbelievers about uh, science and scientific things. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to begin with Scripture, because that's where we should always begin. Psalm 19 lays the, the groundwork, really, for how we should understand creation and uh, the glory of God and, and the end of science, the purpose of science. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. So, God is continually revealing himself through his creation, through the heavens, through the skies. You know, no one should be able to ever watch a sunrise or a sunset or a starry sky at night and be an atheist because God is continually pouring forth speech and knowledge throughout the whole world. There's no words involved. This is general revelation, we call this, and it is the universal witness of God to his own reality. It's actually the foundation of how science emerged in history uh, is belief in this. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. What does our culture teach us? Well, our culture teaches us lots of things. But regarding Christianity and science, our culture teaches us that Christianity is anti-science. That when Christians were in charge of the world, we had the Dark Ages. And that only since science has silenced the public influence of Christian superstition, have we seen real scientific and technical progress. Culture teaches that the Bible and Christian faith are incompatible with scientific progress, and that Christians want to drag our culture back into a pre-science dark ages. Hmm. Is any of that true? Well, we're going to sort of unpack that and counter that with what I think is the reality that's observable in the world and from history. And we begin with the fact that the Christian worldview actually best supports real scientific inquiry and development. The concept of the Dark Ages, that the Middle Ages were this Dark Ages time, is largely a myth. It's a misunderstanding of history and of reality. Uh, the truth is that science arose out of Christian universities in the Middle Ages and that most of the early influential scientists were, in fact, Christians. Now, it's true that many scientists do have an anti-God bias, but not all of them. It's also true that many Christians tend to have an anti-science bias, but not all of them. So, that's our sort of counter-reality. And notice in there, we are affirming, we're acknowledging that many Christians do, in fact, have an anti-science bias, and that that's not always a good thing. It's always important when you're speaking to unbelievers that you acknowledge that Christians are not perfect and that we are often at fault and we do and say stupid things and because we're people and you know we're not we're not trying to defend the beliefs and practices of all Christians. We're trying to basically provide a defense for or provide an apologetic for or provide a cultural engagement with the truth claims of Christianity, the truth of the Bible, the truth of, of Christ. So let's begin with the Christian worldview and how it provides the best foundation for science. The Christian worldview tells us that because God is the creator, one God who is good 
and who is rational and who is reasonable, the universe has fixed and predictable patterns. It has laws. The universe is not, in fact, random chaos. The Bible teaches us further that people are made in God's image and are called to have dominion over creation. So if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of Scripture, we find that on day 6, God says, Let us make man in our image. So in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and he said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over all the creation. As in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, you can go read that. But <clears throat> so not only did God make the world, but God put, put people in the world as those who are made in his image and said to people, you are called to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and to rule over creation. Now, we are to rule over creation as the image bearers of God, as those who are to reflect his character, which is a good and wise and caring fatherly care. Uh, and the fact is that all science and all technological progress and, and really the best of environmentalism, they're all based upon that truth that we're made in God's image, that we can discover the natural laws that God has made. We can predict accurately based on those laws. We can do scientific experiments. We can make technology. We can advance with progress of the technological development. We can we can tame the natural world in places to reduce harm that's being done. We can also nurture the natural world in places to produce life and flourishing. We can be wise stewards of God's good creation. And furthermore, the truth is that if you, if you study both classical Greek philosophy and if you really think about modern naturalistic evolution philosophy, they actually both contradict these truths that form the vital foundation for science. Now, what do I mean by that? Classical Greek philosophy says that the world emerged out of chaos and that there is, you know, life, but there's also death. There's, you know, progress, but there's also destruction. And actually, classical Greek philosophy sees history as a cycle, repeating cycle of creation, destruction, creation, destruction. And this, because the universe emerged out of chaos, there's an unpredictability to the world. And while it is true that classical Greeks did some of the early math and science work, it really was despite the dominant worldview of their culture and not because of it. And I would say in modern times, even though many atheistic, naturalistic evolutionists uh, do science, it's actually despite that philosophy and not because of it. Um, Alvin Plantinga, who's a philosopher at uh, Notre Dame, has done, uh, actually Cornelius Plantinga, uh, and Alvin's his brother, they've both done work on this, but uh, they, they both have pointed out the idea that Evolution, if, if, if the atheistic, naturalistic account of evolution is true, you know, there's evolution that's actually observable and is part of God's creation, but then there's the worldview of evolution that says there is no God and everything happens only by random chance. So if there is no God and everything only happens by random chance and we've just sort of stumbled our way by accident into being what we are, What's the rule for Darwinian natural selection is simply the survival of the fittest, it is simply the ability to procreate, the ability to keep going, is what makes you a winner in the Darwinian evolutionary worldview. So our brains would then be equipped primarily for survival and not necessarily for accurate understanding of what really is in the world, right? It's just, a, it's just a matter of random adaptations, mutations, and then whichever one survives best makes it. Whichever one doesn't survive best doesn't make it. Out of that sort of chaos, it's, it's, it's really another form of chaos, isn't it? Think about it. 
random mutation chance over time. It's just another version of chaos. Why should we think that out of that chaos would emerge a, an animal, an animal species, that's all we are in evolution, that has an actual clear rational mind and reliable perception so that we can do what needs to be done in science, make predictions, conduct experiments, come up with conclusions, develop technology based upon those conclusions, all those things that we associate with doing science, why should we expect that that would emerge out of, out of a process of chaos? There's no reason to think that it would, or should, or could. And so it is actually a Christian worldview that says God made an orderly world and put people in it who are made in his image and calls them to exercise dominion that provides the best foundation for doing science. And if we go back and look at history, we go from this theology that says, Christian theology says the world is an intentional creation of a personal loving God who's made us in his image, has given us dominion over creation, this, this creating a basis for science as opposed to other religions or naturalism. If we take from this theology, we go back to history. Let's go to history and study and see, is this actually what happened? Because, hey, when Christians were in charge, we had the Dark Ages, right? Mm, maybe not. Maybe that's not actually what happened in history. And what we find if we study history is that actually throughout the Middle Ages, natural philosophy, that's what they called science in the Middle Ages, natural philosophy, observation and experimentation was being done in universities that were sponsored by and protected by the church, that were Christian universities. So let's do a little bit of a trip down history lane just because of this whole Dark Ages, Middle Ages, Christians anti-science myth is so prominent. We're going to do a little bit of history to try to provide some factual basis to, to counter this. Where did the first universities in the world emerge? The University of Bologna in 1088 is generally regarded as the first university, the first place where people gathered to study in an organized, systematic way and to advance a body of knowledge and scholarship. Um, the second was the University of Paris, which was established around 1150 and uh, later associated with the Sorbonne. So that's, uh, you know, the University of Paris is sometimes called the Sorbonne. And then the third was the University of Oxford in 1167. These are all during the Middle Middle Ages, hundreds of years before the scientific revolution and enlightenment comes along in the 1600s and 1700s. Later universities emerge in Cologne and Erfurt and Prague and Würzburg and Heidelberg and Vienna. So these are the first generations of universities. And what did people study there? Well, theology was called the queen of the sciences because it was considered to be that which gave the organizing principle the uni in the university. So university is the idea of unity in diversity. Can we find unity? Can we find a body of knowledge that would bring together in one the learning of different fields? And the primary fields that they focused on were theology, law, and natural philosophy. And natural philosophy is, is what we would call today science. Um, now, some historians call it pre-science because they weren't following the formal scientific method precisely. Um, but still, it's natural philosophy, and they did a lot of important scientific work in terms of experimentation and observation. There were two main tasks that were being done in natural philosophy at these medieval universities. On the one hand, they were developing and refining the scientific method, which Sir Francis Bacon would later formalize, and he's considered in history the world's first scientist. So they were doing experimentation and observation, and they were learning how to go from making a hypothesis to testing that hypothesis to establishing a theory. They were doing this kind of work in the Middle Ages. And the other thing they were doing was trying to better understand the heavens. There was a, a great focus in medieval natural philosophy on astronomy, 
the motion of heavenly bodies, the nature of light. This was a, a, a fascinating area of investigation for them. And they were doing so without a lot of our mo modern scientific instruments, but they were doing so on the basis of very accurate and very careful observations. Um, they, they, they made a lot of progress, really. Um, we think of it as dark ages, but it really, really wasn't. Um, some of the greatest scientists of the Middle Ages, Robert Grossetesta in the 1100s, he was the one that um, saw that rainbows involve reflected light coming through raindrops and thus made a correction to Aristotle. Uh, he was the first one to distinguish astronomy, which is the observation of the movements of the stars, from astrology, which is the idea that the stars control life on Earth. Um, he helped improve the scientific method through what he called resolution and composition. After him came along Albert Magnus, who wrote 38 books. He was a great theologian, but he was also the best field botanist of the Middle Ages, studying plants. He also studied geography and astronomy and chemistry, and he challenged the received wisdom of the ancients by his own observations and measurements and experiments. And then along in the 1200s comes Roger Bacon. Um, I think I said Sir Francis Bacon earlier. I don't know where that would come from. Confusing Sir Francis Drake with Roger Bacon. I do that sometimes. All right, Roger Bacon comes along as the first scientist, and he's really building on the foundation that was laid by Grossetesta. Uh, he valued empiricism. That was observation over received authority. So if something was being passed down as, this is the received authority of our tradition, going back to Aristotle, he would say, well, let me do my own experimentation and my own observation and see what I find out. And that actually is the beginning of science. Um, his, his great work, his Opus Magis, which is great work, was almost 2,000 pages of scientific knowledge and theory. It was written in one year. It was about math and the size and the position of heavenly bodies, about lenses and mirrors, magnifying glasses, spectacles. It had a recipe for gunpowder. It also predicted the development of the telescope, the microscope, and the flying machine. Again, this is in the 1200s, where we think, oh man, those people were just in the Dark Ages. Well, no, they were actually doing important study, and they were developing their understanding of the world in a way that was very progressive and very enlightened, shall we say, for the time. And they were, and they were Christians. Uh, other great scientists of the Middle Ages, you have a list there on the screen, um, but these people studied the motions of heavenly bodies and optics and kinetics and dynamics and space uh, as a frictionless vacuum and how the earth turns on its axis. Yes, they believed that the earth was round and that it turned on its axis. That was not something that came out of the Enlightenment or the scientific revolution. This is one of my own pet peeves that you were probably taught in history class. I almost guarantee you were taught this in history class. In the Middle Ages, everybody thought the world was flat, and that if you sailed to the end of the world, you would fall right off the edge. And it was Christopher Columbus who sailed in 1492 and who was the first one to say, no, the world is round, and you can get to Asia by sailing west over the ocean, and you can get there. That's just not true. Like, that's a huge myth, okay? Dante wrote the Divine Comedy in 1300. Okay, I've taught it several times. Uh, you know, the famous Inferno about hell and Purgatorio and Paradiso, the Divine Comedy of Dante, 1300. In the Divine Comedy, if you read it, the earth is clearly a sphere because he goes down into hell and then he emerges on the other side of the world and he goes up a mountain. So the world is clearly a sphere. And actually all scientists, all educated people, and all nobles knew that the world was a sphere. There was a popular conception among many commoners that the world was flat. But that was never held by educated people and was never officially taught by the church or anything like that. So this idea that Christians are flat earthers, you see that a lot on the internet. Oh, they're Christians, well, they're just flat earthers. You know, they're anti-scientific. No, like Nicholas Aresma in the 1300s was saying that the earth turns on its axis and that explains the rotation of the heavenly bodies. 
Uh, it's just not true that these Christians were, were uh, anti-science. In fact, one of my favorite books on this topic is called How the West Won the Neglected Story of the Triumph of Modernity uh, by Rodney Stark. And he's got a chapter called Science Comes of Age. Um, and in the Science Comes of Age, he does, a, he does a comprehensive study of science during the scientific revolution, which is the 1600s. And he makes a comprehensive list of the 52 most influential scientists of the scientific revolution. You probably would recognize some of these names. Robert Boyle, who gave us Boyle's Law in chemistry. Copernicus, who had the Copernican Revolution that said the Earth is the center of the solar system. Rene Descartes. Um, you have um, Robert Hooke, who was an important uh, chemist. Uh, Johannes Kepler, Kepler's motion laws. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the very, very intelligent man who's on your screen. Um, just so many great, great minds who really did the foundational work for science in the 1500s and 1600s. There's 52 of them. And he just went and surveyed who were the 52 like great scientists of the scientific revolution. And then he studied, he asked, what do we know about their faith? What do we know about their belief system? And what he found was among these 52 scientists, there was one skeptic. There was one non-Christian. One out of 52. The other 51, 31 of those 51 were devout Christians, regular churchgoers, serious students of the Bible who said very strong theological things. And the other 20 of the 51 were conventional Christians. They were regular church-going, professing Christians. Only one skeptic among the 52. And this guy who's on the screen, Sir Isaac Newton, many people regard him as potentially the smartest person who's ever lived. Um, and that's just not just me saying, you may think Albert Einstein, those two guys are usually held up there as the, the smartest couple of guys who ever lived. Sir Isaac Newton, he discovered the law of gravity and he invented calculus, invented calculus. He discovered the universal laws of motion he discovered that if you refract white light through a prism, you can see the whole color spectrum, thus confirming the earlier theory about rainbows being a refraction of light through uh, droplets of water. He made the first reflecting telescope, the first telescope that had a mirror that could focus the light so that you could get a better picture. And did you know that he wrote more about God and the Bible than he did about science and math? Sir Isaac Newton, uh, genius and inventor of so much of what we need for the foundation, was a Christian. Uh, and so this challenges the idea that this Middle Ages was just the Dark Ages and that Christians were anti-science. Christians were the ones doing the science. Christians really invented science. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say Christianity invented science. Uh, historically, that would hold up to scrutiny very well. It came out of Christian universities, from Christian thinkers, in all fields of science, from chemistry to biology to astronomy to physics. The foundational work was all laid down by Christians. So why are Christianity and science in conflict today, as we're often told they are? Well, at times, Christianity and science are in conflict today. And I think that part of that's because you have many modern famous scientists who are atheists and who have said things against Christianity. So you have Richard Dawkins, who's a biologist um, from Oxford, and you have uh, Stephen Hawking, physicist, famous atheists who are great scientists and who made statements against that. But, you know, those two guys... Just, just to give you a little bit of a snippet of an insight into their scientific minds, Richard Dawkins, who's a biologist, an evolutionary biologist who absolutely refuses to acknowledge that God exists, when pressed about where life on Earth comes from, he acknowledges that DNA, DNA, which is at the cell of every living thing and is the code for making life, 
He says DNA is, is a code, a written code, that is advanced and sophisticated and is actually more advanced and sophisticated than our computer coding because our computer coding uses ones and zeros. It's a binary language, whereas DNA uses four uh, letters and base pairs. It's, there's a lot to go into it. But did you know that inside the nucleus of every cell in your body, just wrap your head around this, inside the nucleus of every cell in your body, each DNA pair that you have, each pair of chromosomes that makes up your DNA, stores the equivalent of about three terabytes of information. Three terabytes of coded information that sits inside the nucleus of every cell so small that you can't even see it. Go out and try to buy a three terabyte hard drive and see how much it costs you and through, see how big it is. So even Richard Dawkins has to say, well, this had to come from some intelligence. But he doesn't want to believe in God, so he says it comes from some intelligence, probably alien life, seeded early Earth with DNA molecules that then made life. Aliens. That's Richard Dawkins' solution. Stephen Hawking famously wrote, because such a thing as the law of gravity exists, the universe had to have created itself out of nothing. That was his explanation for the origin of the universe. He's a, he's a physicist, theoretical physicist. Because such a thing as gravity exists, where did gravity come from? Don't know, but it exists. Because such a thing as gravity exists, the universe had to have created itself out of nothing. So these are the two great atheistic scientific minds. One is claiming aliens and the other is claiming spontaneous generation. The universe created itself out of nothing. And the explanation for that is because such a thing as gravity exists. So just because a scientist is an atheist and is very outspoken doesn't mean that his atheism is very scientific. You get that? Just because a scientist is an atheist doesn't mean that his atheism is very scientific. Um, a another problem is that science has overstepped its rightful bounds. Science does a good job at observation, experimentation, development. Of it doesn't do a good job at recreating history. Um, there's a lot of problems with, with the fossil record and carbon dating and trying to recreate through the genetic code how things got here. This is kind of science getting beyond its limits. And science really gets beyond its limits when it wants to be the sole source of truth, knowledge, and authority in everyone's life, which sometimes it acts that way. And so Christians sometimes respond against that and say, oh, these scientists are atheists and they hate God and science is trying to rule the world, therefore I'm going to be anti-science. And that's not right either because science is a gift from God. And so we cannot allow the abuse of science by certain people who are anti-God to cause us to react against science. That would be wrong. So what can we do? Very quickly to close, we can study and appreciate the Christian history and philosophy of science. We can appreciate the good discoveries of science as gifts from God. We can lovingly challenge scientific claims that are really worldview claims. And we can listen to Christians who are doing excellent work in science and apologetics. And if you want help doing all of this, I'll direct you to one person, Dr. John Lennox, who's a professor of mathematics, emeritus, retired from Oxford University. Oxford University mathematics professor, Dr. John Lennox. He, he's, a, he's an apologist now. He engages in debates with scientists and atheists and does a really great job in his, his ministry has great resources for helping you think through these issues. So I know I gave you a lot in a half an hour, which I always do, um, but you can have the recording. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions or send you follow-up resources. Um, happy to serve you guys in any way that I possibly can. Appreciate your ministry. Appreciate the way you serve our community. And I'm very happy to serve you however I possibly can. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your world that you've created and for the gift of science that allows us to explore and understand your world. Help us to appreciate science and to use it properly for your glory, which is why you gave it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.